You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Welcome to Heritage Voices, Episode 12, with the Meshantucket Pequot Tippo. And today, this is Jessica Uquinto, and I'll be your host. So today we have with us Marissa Turnbull and Michael Johnson from the Mashantucket Pequot Tippo office. And so if you guys want to just take a moment to introduce yourselves. Well, hello. Thank you for having us. Um, my name is Marissa Turnbull, and I currently serve as the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer and also the NAGPRA coordinator for the Mashantucket Pequot Tribal Nation. And my name is Michael Kicking Bear Johnson, um, also a member of the Mashantucket Pequot Tribal Nation and um, recently appointed, I would say, Deputy Tippo, working under Marissa and I'm learning an awful lot from her and uh, also a fellow podcaster. Yeah. So what's the, the name of your podcast again? It's Native Opinion, right? Native Opinion at nativeopinion.com. Yep. Okay. All right. So your tribe has, has a pretty interesting history. So... I know that I'm sure that we could talk about that for a really long time, but would you mind just really briefly summing it up? I, I would say for the most part, um, the Mash and Tucket Pequot Tribal Nation is is quite unique in comparison to the history, especially in relation to federal Indian policy. Um, and so a lot of our policies um, do not necessarily match what we find for the average federal state tribal relationships um, with pre-contact we find that our history is a lot different especially from those in the midwest and the west and so a lot of our land policies allotment um, creation of reservation um, things of that nature really happened many years prior to um, when it was experienced by the rest of the tribal nations. Originally, we were state recognized. We were federally recognized in um, the 80s. Um, and a lot of development um, on the land-based side started to you know, happen after that. Directly after federal recognition, um, our land base was expanded. Um, and from that point, we went into a lot of development projects. Um, and we continue to build and kind of change from from that point forward. Mm -hmm. And so we should probably mention real quick that the Pequots are in Connecticut. So this is an yes. East Coast tribe. So this is our first East Coast tribe that we're talking to. Oh, great. And okay. <laughs> yeah, so definitely it'll be interesting to talk a little bit about some of those those differences there. But um, well, I, I like to my say that um, colonialism okay. actually was born here. And, um, and so we, you know, we, we try to bring, you know, a, a new perspective, I think, um, to the rest of the country relevant to our understanding and experiences around, around, um, the birth of, of the United States, because it, it, it all pretty much started here. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So well, I guess before I go into my next question, do you want to explain a little bit more what you mean when you say colonialism was born here? Well, um, you know, everybody talks about um, first contact, um, which uh, most people are pointing at uh, uh, the pilgrims and um, their contact with the Wampanoag Nation in Massachusetts. Um, but very few know about what transpired after that. As a matter of fact, um, with our tribe in uh, the War of 1637, it was actually the first uh, war fought on, we'll call it American soil, than anywhere else in, in the United States. And uh, it's just simply not told, so a lot of people uh, aren't aware of that. And um, it was a I would also say it was probably the first documentation of an attempted genocide of a people, which happened to be um, our tribe. So, um, you know, a lot of people kind of raise eyebrows because they, they either aren't aware of the story or, um, sadly, with, with our tribe, they, they, think of, uh, they think of casinos before they think of the people behind it. So, um, so we, we, we try to share um, our history um, even though it, some of it might be sad, but um, but we feel it just it needs to be told. So, so yeah, that was kind of an interesting thing when I was looking up the history of your tribe. One thing that 
got mentioned several times was how close, how there was only basically, what was it, one or two families that were still actually living on the the Pequot, um, I guess it was a state reservation, was it, before federal... Mm -hmm federal recognition so um and you mentioned that the federal recognition happened in the 80s right correct yeah so what was the the impetus or how what was that process like for the tribe well for that process um you know i would say it was quite a lengthy process and as you mentioned there were only a select amount of families um residing on the reservation prior to recognition. A lot of that had to do with the the constant movement. Um, the state government, if you look at the state of Connecticut and prior to that, our land base, our Aboriginal territory was quite extensive. Um, and over time, um, certain aspects were implemented that continually um, displaced us um, to a point um, where the reservation was established um, in the 1600s, where we're currently located at Mashantucket. Um, at that point, we still had certain, you know, fishing and access rights to the other locations. And after that time period, um, you know, the mid 1600s, we really only had access to um, the present day reservation. Mashantucket um, is translated to a much wooded place, place of many trees. And that was really the area that we would go to more in winter for hunting and things of that nature. Our ability to maintain our way of life, um, especially when it comes to food systems, was made very challenging. We were given a very, very rocky um, piece of land, and so farming um, was not something that was necessarily easy. Um, and so it made it nearly impractical to actually uh, survive on the reservation. A lot of families left strictly um, for work. Um, and so it was it was very much about survival. And you know some of those aspects are still very much present um, today. Right. Yeah. And that's a, a very common tale of reservations across the U.S. Mm -hmm. where they've been forced onto portions of their of their aboriginal territory that they can't survive mm -hmm. in their traditional ways. Yep. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about that, about how you were then able to make your reservation economically viable. For that process, um, again, several families residing on the reservation at that point. And it it was around the time period of the American Indian movement where we start to see smaller um, tribal communities, not just of Mashantucket, but the regional tribes of this area, Narragansett, Mohegan, Pequot, um, Wampanoag, um, coming together in smaller um, communities off of their reservations. So um, areas that are close to where we live, not cities, but larger towns. And at that point, people started to come together to really organize to better understand Native rights um, and what we could do um, as a group um, and individually. And this was a process that there were several tribes on the East Coast going through a federal recognition process. At that point, Mash and Tucket Pequots made the decision to come back home, even though we knew or they knew how challenging it was going to be, not necessarily having a job, um, having to find homes, to build homes, funding um, for homes on the reservation, and really coming together to figure out what we could do to be self-sustainable. And at that point, a lot, a lot of smaller projects um, started on the reservation. Um, so community gardening, um, you know, for food for the community, going through certain funding processes, and really just working um, at the state and federal level. Um, our recognition came through um, 
Congress, um, and it, it surrounded um, a lot of court cases directly involved with land. Um, and going back to our Aboriginal territory, uh, the Trade and Intercourse Act, um, and that land being sold illegally. Um, and so really, the bulk of um, this consisted of Mash and Tuckett's making the decision to come back home um, and to also organize and work with the state and federal government to um, have some of our land back um, so that we could remain as a community. Mm-hmm. And so real quick, just before we move forward, just because I'm curious, has there been any efforts? You mentioned the community garden and I know that um, for a lot of tribes right now, there's there's this big food sovereignty movement. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I was just wondering whether or not you were incorporating any of that into your your community garden efforts. Well, the community garden that originally started, um, it again was um, quite extensive. Um, you know, looking back through the history of that, currently today we do have um, a community garden which is in our um, community housing area Um, and that was started several years ago and it's a great opportunity for tribal youth to come together with other community members to learn the process of planting of growing we have a community um, daycare center on the reservation for our tribal students um, and they also partake in you know smaller community garden um, initiatives um, as well and so that's that's something that's restarting at this time um, there's a lot of um, kind of as you mentioned we're trying to go more into um, agriculture um, and in that field um, and presenting that opportunity, it's something that we have traditionally done um, and to involve the youth in something that, um, you know, will be beneficial um, for them moving forward. Okay, so I think we're at a good stopping point for our first break already. I know, <laughs> it's quick. <Okay. laughs> um, so we will be right back in a moment. This network is supported by our listeners. You can become a supporting member by going to arcpodnet.com slash members and signing up. As a supporting member, you have access to high quality downloads of each show and a discount at our future online store and access to show hosts on a members only Slack team. For professional members, we'll have training shows and other special content offered throughout the year. Once again, go to arcpodnet.com slash members to support the network and get some great extras and swag in the process. That's arcpodnet.com slash members. So we are back. And I just, since we, since you just brought this up, I want to touch a little bit more on it. You mentioned that you have a daycare for your kids. And I'm just curious whether or not you incorporate any sort of, of cultural learning into this daycare or anything like that. That is a very good question. (laughs) We've had um, the daycare center probably for a little over 20 years. And so it's gone through various transitions and um, we have more attendance, I would say. Um, Certain transitions, as of recently, several years ago, um, the management has changed to a non-tribal management team, which is very interesting. Um, hmm. But we have made it so that it always has um, cultural curriculum implemented. And it, it varies um, depending on the time period, but we have always had our cultural resources department, for instance, teaching classes at the daycare center. Mm-hmm. Lang- Pequot language classes would be a great example. Um, mm-hmm. These students probably start at two months old um, and going to kindergarten level. Um, that's yep. where the daycare stops. But they have Pequot language courses several times a week. Um, cultural classes, kind of beating, dancing, um, and, you know, a lot of language, I would say, language dance, um, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and is that something that continues once they're past that age? Like, is there anything that's offered for school age kids or adults or or elderly people? Anything? Um, there, there is. Through a, I would. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to step on you. There, um, probably through our again our cultural department, um, uh, kind of um, has more. We'll call it uh, teens and and adult um, programming. You know, in, in that sense. And uh, that's pretty much continuous um, all year long and um, mm-hmm. including even uh, like botany studies and things like that. Because, again, we're, we're a eastern woodland uh, tribe. And so um, we like to uh, immerse ourselves, um, including botany. Very cool. Uh, I definitely one of these days I need to get somebody on here that is doing more of that, that cultural education directly. So I won't ask you guys too much more about that um i'm always fascinated with with, with food stuff from a, um like health food I, i'll never understand for the life of me why it costs me more to buy quote things that are good for me in a store as opposed to the the junk <laughs> so mm-hmm. by teaching um uh more about you know, plant life and food uh life if you will um, I think it really, it really does encourage, um, to be more self-sufficient and health conscious in that, in that regard, because there's a lot mm-hmm. of bad stuff out there. Yeah. Well, and food is just one of those things that it's just so basic to culture. Yeah. Yep. You know what I mean? That's like one of the main ways that people really connect. So it just seems yeah. like such a natural place to start. Mm-hmm. But one other um, area that I would like to point out, just because it's it's fascinating and um, just a wonderful experience that the tribe has participated in for several years for the students, um, and it's a cultural exchange program mm. with our students here, um, probably around 10 to 17, that age range, and it's an exchange program where um, tribal students from Point Lay in Alaska come here um, for an extended period of time to stay on the reservation, to um, learn from tribal members here, and to also interact with our youth. And it's been several years now, and so the relationships between our tribal youth and the Point Lay um, youth um, has been a wonderful experience. So that is something where our tribal youth um, this year um, are going back out to Alaska um, to, you know, learn, um, you know, what they're doing there. And they have a really, you know, great experience kind of learning whaling and and other initiatives. So subsistence living, I always stumble on that word, I apologize, is, is so, it's, it's so ingrained. It's part of uh, Alaskan culture um, that it's it's a great experience because what we do share is um, you know the sea, and mm-hmm. and um, and so it, it's good for them to have have those cultural exchanges to talk about um, the similarities as well as obviously observing and understanding what some of the differences are too. But um, but yeah, it's it's a it's a great program for them. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. That's super interesting. Those are two obviously very different kinds of places. And I'm sure that's, yeah. it'd be really interesting to hear what they, what they have to say about the, what the similarities and the, the differences they notice are. Yeah. Completely. Definitely. Hmm. So obviously one of, one of the big challenges that your tribe has been facing. So you've, since federal recognition, you've developed a casino and that casino has been turning this reservation land that um, was economically not very sustainable for your tribe into something that is is much more sustainable. But with that has has come quite a few challenges, and specifically this challenge that you mentioned of people fighting your tribe's very right to exist, basically. Mm -hmm. So would you mind talking a little bit about that experience and um, what, what your tribe has done to, to face that? Um, I think that, um, and I'm talking more from myself personally. Um, I don't think we can necessarily talk on behalf of the nation per se, but, um, Mm -hmm. Um, with the exception, of course, of, of you know our office and our and our areas 
um, of understanding. But um, at the heart of uh, fear is, in my opinion, lack of education. And um, and so and also, quite quite frankly, as I, as we opened with, um, it's a form of colonialism that um, that tribes across the country continue to uh, to to fight because it was a, it was a, it's a matter of understanding first and foremost that it's happening to us. Um, and what those forms are, I think the most basic example might be um, the fight over masketry, and um, you know people using imagery of uh, of our culture in uh, ways that uh, that either we don't like or they never ask permission to. You know, sport teams mm-hmm. is, is one example of that. But when we're but what what I find interesting is that when um, you come from nothing and you grow into something. Uh, either through, uh, you know, economic means and economic means, by the way, can can also be like land development. It doesn't have to necessarily be tied to a, a gaming or a casino operation. Mm-hmm. Um, suddenly, um, there seems to be a shift in, uh, well, those people over there don't deserve that. And um, and that's it's sad um, initially. And I'm not saying everybody is like that, but um, but sadly, um, it just seems like there's a there's a shift when people um, are perceived to become prosperous. Um, so we've experienced uh, some of that here, and um, more, more more recently was, is a campaign that we have ongoing um, to save uh, jobs because, uh, like like everyone, we, uh, we we took an enormous hit with the economy um, that never really fully recovered since 9/11. Mm-hmm. And um, and also um, more casino development. So um, you know, Connecticut recognized the potential of job loss to other states, and um, has been working with our tribe as well as the Mohegan tribe, who were actually um, uh, related uh, specifically. We were all once one tribe at one point, and um, they have uh, the Connecticut has at least. Uh, cleared the path to allow a third gaming operation because the Mohegans have a gaming operation in this state as well. Mm-hmm. But the backlash to some degree um, from anti-casino groups um, doesn't stop, sadly, with just their concerns about things that are relevant, such as traffic control, um, the uh, the stress that can happen with a with a smaller town uh, when resources, because if you're increasing employment, that's more people coming into a state. And that, you know, that's that's a good thing on the surface. But the, the residual is the schools are busier, for example, and those right. resources are being uh, consumed at a greater rate than most budgets can assume. And of course, when they ask for more money, um, the towns and or states start to waffle, which I always find interesting as well. Um, another case in point might be what something I tracked personally when, um, shortly about, I'd say fifth or sixth year that, that our casino was open. Um, I went to give a talk at a high school in, uh, Hartford, Connecticut and noticed that the lights were off. There was no air conditioning. And I knew for a fact that the state had received, you know, in excess of $600 million that year. And I asked the teachers, I said, why is the why is why is why are the kids sitting in a dark classroom with uh with very little AC and they're like we we can't afford to run the lights all day and and run mm-hmm. AC mm-hmm. so you know when when those types of things um aren't consistently brought forward so that everybody can get a, a full picture people get a very slanted picture and they look at um you know those Indians over there that are just growing their operation it's bigger and bigger every year it seems like and suddenly um you know, people come out of the woodwork that that are suddenly against um, at least our success in economic growth. So um, we we've experienced quite a bit of that, and even here in the local town levels, we had you know we'd have to drive to our reservation um, and see signs like "Not in my backyard" uh, when when we were approaching or talking about a redefining of our reservation boundaries. You know, so this is going back uh, about 15 years ago, not that long ago, but. Um, so, you know, it's just, you, you kind of have to put everything in context, um, I think, uh, relevant to to this subject. But, um, but yeah, that, and again, what I'm speaking of is more of my own observations and my own personal opinions. So, mm-hmm. yeah. 
Marissa, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that? Um, for the challenges for the reservation, I, I find that when gaming was introduced, that that topic tends to be at the forefront of conversation, while the tribal community, um, the tribe itself, is often a second thought. And the challenge for the tribal community, again, is one of survival. We're, We're still in a state of survival or trying to exist. And that can become challenging when we are perceived um, by the outside as, you know, just a gaming operation. Right. You're subtracting the um, person from the scenario. And it goes back to historical trauma, to understanding mm-hmm. our past and how it connects to us today. And as a group, continually having to adjust for survival. And so we have constantly transitioned. We had an economic boost, perhaps, um, that is now leveling out. Um, and so there are challenging challenges in the sense of zoning, uh, regulations, um, constant constitutional reformation, for instance, making sure that everything fits the current situation, which is constantly changing. And so the human aspect um, has been a challenge, I would say, for, for the community, for the community not necessarily being recognized um, as a people. Um, and it's not just Um, economic development. It's not just gaming. Mm -hmm. Um, The human side of our experience, what we're experiencing today, and making sure that what we have in place matches what we need in order to um, make changes um, moving forward. The transition from state recognition to federal recognition, um, again, it goes back to certain regulations, what's applicable, um, protecting our rights. Um, and so that that transition, we, we've had to make adjustments again um, throughout that transition. And being in a new place today, um, we're again continuing to make those adjustments in in the best way possible but um it's certainly challenging when um there was a lot available and now um we're working with what we have the resources that we have and ultimately our people being the biggest resource for the community Hmm. the other thing i think i want to add as well is um from an economic point of view, sort of. Um, our tribe was engaged in uh, what we called Indio, uh, Indian bingo for the first 10 years before a casino was even considered. Um, and there was no intention really to grow that. Um, and as a matter of fact, here's a fun fact for everybody. Um, our tribal elders uh, saw the wisdom to um, actually vote down Foxwoods Resort Casino three times before it was um, actually, uh, we'll call phase one, approved. Um, you know, for, uh, you know, a number of reasons. Um, but so you have to kind of put things in context where, you know, we had tried doing um, hydroponic growth um, for lettuce and other types of vegetables as a business model. There was a, um, a pizza restaurant called the Owl's Nest uh, that we ran for several years uh, prior to even doing bingo. You know, so these are all enterprises through the 70s. Um, as well as, you know, a few other things, um, raising pigs, all, all kinds of different things um, just, to, just to sustain the community at the time. Um, and then decided to engage in, uh, in bingo. So um, most people, I think, just sort of assume we decided to go straight into casino gaming. Um, but that, that actually isn't the case. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Kind of what both of you are, are talking about, about that when when you're successful economically that human piece um 
kind of gets lost to everybody around you. Mm-hmm. And it seems like that's kind of a a common trend, I would say, I guess, uh, across the country where when people are faced with, with casino tribes that are successful, that um, – Basically, it's either, oh, you've lost your culture, you're um, selling out, yeah. mm-hmm. or, um, or or more of what it sounds like you were facing, which was, oh, you're not a real Indian, you shouldn't have been able to do this in the first place. Correct. Um, so, I guess, do you have any advice or what kind of of response have you guys had when facing people saying to you oh you're not real indians how do you how do you respond to that how do you come back from that oh it's <laughs> not to not to throw out a giant emotional question right there <laughs> yeah, yeah no it's it's something that growing up you learn to deal with because you have to um mm-hmm. it's has been a constant theme, a constant question that you are asked as a tribal person, I would say. Um, We have a unique history and we receive those questions very often. Um, My past experience, I was an educator for a time period at the Mashantucket Pequot Museum and Research Center. And so my involvement with school groups, school teachers, and other individuals, we would receive that question, or I would bring them through a tour and explain the history, um, everything about tribal people, and at the end, we would receive that question, do Pequots still exist? Um, And so I would say, I am Mashantucket Pequot, I am standing here, I am a tribal person, and kind of go back and review history. There seems to be a gap right after federal recognition where individuals seem to get lost, where they have a particular image of what you have to look like Uh, in order to be Native American, in order to be Pequot. And so better explaining our history and where mixed ancestry, I guess you could say, um, plays Mm -hmm. a part. Um, Understanding um, after contact um, when a lot of our men were going away to find jobs. They were whaling, um, they were leaving the reservation, and it would leave women and children on the reservation and the elderly. And a lot of times what when the overseers um, would come to the reservation, that's all they're seeing. They're seeing small mm-hmm. numbers of individuals and they're seeing the elderly and children and women. And when the men are off at sea for that extended period of time, a lot of them actually either stayed at port, perhaps they just did not come back, um, lost at sea, whatever the situation may be. Pequot women really held everything down on Mm -hmm. the reservation. And at that point, you would see non-tribal individuals coming onto the reservation and being part of the family in a sense. Um, So going back to the history as far as um, why you may see certain differences um, and also clarifying, um, you know, what it actually means to to be a tribe, to be a tribal person. It's not necessarily... um, it may not necessarily follow, you know, the federal model. Um, it, it may not be about blood quantum. It's not something that traditionally, um, you know, we came up with or that we applied. Um, and so really education being um, the biggest piece. Um, but even with that, I, I find that it's it's a constant topic, um, you know, that is, it's, it's tif- difficult for the children, I would say, the most, having that experience going through school, um, sometimes having that tag, and I know that's horrible mm-hmm. to say, but it's it's still very true today. Where hundreds of years ago, where you know we hear our 
great great grandparents wouldn't tell us certain things because they were trying to protect us for us not Mm -hmm. to speak the language um because they wanted the best for us Mm -hmm. and i find that is still very much the case which is you know very heartbreaking but true and I'd like mm-hmm. to add too. It's not um, just non-native sentiment that um, that holds that about us as well. Unfortunately, it's also some tribes mm-hmm. that like to uh, make no bones about it. Tell us that they don't think we're real Indians. And um, you know, again, it's it, in my opinion. Again, it goes back to education and people not really understanding the full history of the United States. So would you say that it's because it sounds like you have very good relationships with some tribes. Would you say that it's Mm -hmm. maybe to some extent that the the tribes that you work with more directly um, or the nearby tribes have a different response than further away tribes? Or is there any sort of pattern, I guess, to how tribes respond to you? I think that really depends. Uh, For our TIPO office, for instance, we work with the regional tribes of this area. We have the same goals and objectives Mm -hmm. as far as our work, and we find that collaboration works a lot better than working alone in certain scenarios, at least when working with federal and state agencies on federal undertakings and things of that nature. it works better to work together as the other tribes. We do receive it from our neighboring tribes, but it depends on Mm -hmm. the scenario, the topic of conversation, who you're talking to. Mm -hmm. I, I personally went to school in Arizona and I was surrounded by West Coast tribes and I was the only tribal member from an East Coast tribe. And I had a few experiences where individuals were honestly and genuinely confused. And what I learned was by the end, when we graduated, there was a level of understanding. Um, Mm -hmm. So it was a great experience um, where I found they just didn't necessarily have a background of understanding of our tribal history on the East Coast. Um, And so having those relationships allowed them to have a better understanding. But I did receive that, um, you know, from a lot of the West Coast tribes um, as far as, you know, not having a full language um, that I would be able to speak in. Um, I know partial, um, but I was surrounded by individuals that can converse in their in their native language. And it was very strange um, that I could not. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, those more specific differences, um, differences as far as treaties, we didn't have um, treaties that most individuals are familiar with, um, our reservation system, you know, established, um, you know, way before um, the reservation um, policy era occurred. Um, So a a lot of differences, I would say, it's surrounding, you know, neighboring tribes, but also um, out west. But again, you know, education um, and understanding. And I found that was very helpful, um, you know, for when I did reside um, in Arizona. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, there there definitely seems to be a bit of an East Coast yeah. tribes um, have you know they they had contact so early and so they were um, wiped out or intermixed or whatever so mm-hmm. early mm-hmm. that they're basically gone. But I mean, come on, I New Mexico tribes have been in contact yeah. with the Spanish since mm-hmm. you know what 1500s exactly um Mm -hmm. so i don't i don't know why there's that difference in perspective because certainly i mean i would never uh tell a a new mexico tribe that they're not a real tribe that's for sure um so yeah i'm I'm not quite sure so Mm -hmm. do you mind if i share a piece of audio with you because it, it does speak to um this subject as well and then sure. Okay. Let's um, take a quick break. Sure. And then um, let's start with it, if that's okay. Yeah, no problem. 
All right. Okay, so we're going to take our next break, and we'll be right back. Women in Archaeology is a show about archaeology by the women of archaeology. An alternating panel of women archaeologists discuss the issues in archaeology that impact professionals and the public every day. Check out Women in Archaeology for a different perspective on the past today at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash WIA. Now let's get back to the show. All right, and we are back. So Michael's going to start us out with some audio. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? I do. Um, so I'm going to get a little political. And um, I'm going to play a piece of audio for you guys. This is the uh, sitting occupant of the White House, um, who I, I refuse to personally call, um, call him by the title he wants to be called. And this audio that I'm going to play for you was a hearing um, that he was asked to speak at in 1993. And the audio that you're about to hear is him speaking specifically of Marissa and I's tribe. And um, conveniently, um, a lot of people still are not aware uh, that he said this about the Mashantucket Pequot Tribal Nation. So here's that audio. Is this you discussing Indian blood? We're going to judge people by whether they have Indian blood, whether they're qualified to run a gaming casino or not? Uh, I, that probably is me, absolutely. Because I'll tell you what, if you look if you look at some of the reservations that you've approved, you, sir, and your great wisdom have approved, I will tell you right now, uh, they don't look like Indians to me. And they don't look like the Indians. Now, maybe we say politically correct or not politically correct. They don't look like Indians to me. And they don't look like Indians to Indians. And a lot of people are laughing at it. And you're telling how tough it is, how rough it is to get approved. Well, you go up to Connecticut and you look. Now, they don't look like Indians to me, sir. Thank God that's not the test of whether or not people have rights in this country or not, whether or not they pass your look test. Depends whether, yeah, depends whether or not you're approving it, sir. No, no, it's not a question of whether I'm approving it. It's not a question of whether I'm approving it. Mr. Trump, you know, you know, in the history of this country, where we've heard this discussion before, they don't look Jewish to me. Oh, really? They don't look well, Indian to me. They don't look Italian to me. Mm -hmm. And that was a test for whether people could go into business or not go into business, whether they could get a bank loan. You're too black. You're not black enough. I want to find out. That's you, not a, well, then why are you appro you're approving a, for Indian? Why don't you approve it for everybody then? That's not a if your case is non-discriminatory, why don't you approve for everybody? You're saying well, you only Indians. Wait a minute, sir. Stand for it in five you're saying months. only Indians can have the reservations. Only Indians can have the gaming. So why aren't you approving it for everybody? Why are you being discriminatory? Why is it that the Indians don't pay tax, but everybody else does? I do. So that is uh, Donald J. Trump, 1993. Because uh, uh, Congress, uh, or the, the hearing, was, uh, they asked him to come and speak on a concern that they had heard about, uh, about there being corruption in Indian gaming, which was also fabricated. Um, and he decided to target uh, our tribe at the time. So it's very real to us um, when, when we talk about identity, when we talk about um, unfairness, you know, um, and a lot of, like I said, a lot of people uh, are not aware of that piece of audio right there. Um, it has been played on mainstream, um, but, um, and, and miraculously, it only showed up when uh, he, was, he decided to run. But, um, but as you can see, it goes back quite a, quite a ways, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and <laughs> speaking as a, a Jew that doesn't look like a Jew, I can tell you right now. <laughs> yep. My bright red hair is not what, what people would normally <laughs> associate. Um, yeah, yep. wow. Um, so, thank you for sharing that. That's yeah, it's, it's, um, it's powerful audio. But uh, yeah. yeah, that's an. Um, it's a lot of of. Um, I don't even know what I want to say here. <laughs> yeah, see, I know. That's um, sadly, that's, you know, it, it's a shock, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and yet, you know, that he's the occupant of the White House uh, with all that power. And, you know, um, 
not to sound like a like a, a banner for my for our show, but um, we talk about concerns around, and and I, I I think about this also from the level of tempo. Um, you know, uh, there's there's bills being introduced as we speak regarding land privatization, and I don't think the tribes that um, are really concerned about their their own economic struggles um, are looking at the whole picture. Uh, relevant to what they're introducing. Um, they're trying to present it to, uh, really, it comes down to five to eight tribes that um, are, are thinking about or are already currently in um, energy development, you know, pipelines and, and other things. Um, but the uh, Republican administration is talking about uh, dismantling uh, the IRA or the uh, Indian Reorganization Act. And um, most of uh, Native American sovereignty is uh, is is fundamentally founded in in that act, and we know it's not it's not to benefit tribes the way they're trying to present it. They they they're saying tribes will become more economically uh, stronger because the tribes can do more with their land without government uh, intervention. And I'm just shaking my head, going no, um, especially when. You hear a piece of audio like that, that this is the individual that is presumably championing that. Mm-hmm. So yeah. you kind of have to put things together and put things in perspective. Um, you know, uh, I'm just kind of shaking my head going, no, because, you know, we, we all know what happened with the Dakota Access Pipeline. That's still an ongoing uh, legal issues at this point. But um, there's a lot of people that want to protect lands. And water and resources for the for the right reasons, and um, you know these folks sadly are only looking at being able to extract oil out of the ground and and otherwise destroy the planet as opposed to you know strengthening it. So yeah, and then I think this and tying back to some of the things you said earlier, there's some interesting links and challenges there where. You know, for example, as a casino tribe or like our neighbors here, the the Southern Ute tribe who um, make their make their, you know, they're economically sustainable based on on their oil and gas Mm -hmm. and how, you know, the pushback that that um, those two types of tribes get. Um, And then on the the other hand of things. The, the sovereignty side of things well is it is it really sovereignty if you're not able to um, to do what you want with your land that, that that's um, true. or your mm-hmm. yeah so it's it's interesting and I I mean I guess what I would say is that um, between that and between deciding who gets to be a tribe and and things like that in in my opinion, I definitely shouldn't be the one making those decisions. It shouldn't be um, coming from an outsider. It should be coming from within Indian country. Okay, so I want to make sure that we get to some of this before we we finish up here. So first of all, let's, let's take it back a step and talk a little bit about the work that you do as TIPOs and what you're hoping to accomplish within your tribe as, as a TIPO. Right now, we actually have a plethora of projects and initiatives taking place. Overall, the TIPO office, um, similar to any TIPO office under the federal model, is going to mimic the job functions of a state historic preservation officer or those that you elect to administer. And so that really consists of directing and overseeing all archaeological investigations on tribal land, primarily. And the bulk portion of the work, as of right now at least, is interacting with the federal and um, state agencies, more so federal agencies on the federal undertakings to ensure that projects are absent of historic properties. And I am not trained as an archaeologist, and so we have archaeologists, um, you know, research 
um, components, of course, um, to the job functions to better determine land use practices of the past, what we were doing, where, um, the complete extent of our um, Aboriginal territory. On our part, on the tribal part, we look specifically to traditional cultural properties, sacred sites, ceremonial sites, and that is a process that we jointly do with other tribes um, to survey um, the area of potential effect for federal projects. And, And that has been wonderful to see. Um, It is something that, you know, really just started several years ago where we're able to nominate um, ceremonial sites um, under the National Register for Protection. And, you know, a decade ago that was not in existence. And so we're making steps to be able to better preserve and protect are areas of significance, not only for us, but cultural patrimony in general, um, for even the tribes that are state recognized that don't really have a voice or have a muted voice in a sense in the federal process to make sure that if something is significant to tribal people in this area, for instance, or a state that doesn't have federally recognized tribes, but we're aware that they have um, state recognized tribes that have um, a ceremonial site or a significant site, an archeological site in an area um, that needs to at least be discussed during development to figure out any um, changes that can be made to better protect that area. So we have a lot of off-reservation projects, and again, our our ability um, is a little different. Um, Our authority, of course, is is different on reservation, on tribal trust um, land versus just within our, our Aboriginal territory. We're trying to work as well on the local level. Um, Certain things, unless they receive federal involvement, we're not necessarily aware of what is going on. And so working with the local historical commissions and things of that nature have been helping as far as developing um, MOUs or MOAs um, so that tribes are part of the planning process, I find that consultation, um, overall communication, um, reaching out to tribes so that they can participate in the process is is very important. And it's oftentimes lacking even with something that screams um, tribal. You know, you would you would have to speak to that tribal community um, if if you're doing um, a certain project that you know directly involves their history. And so, We've really been focused on um, internally what we can implement as far as regulations and getting information out to the public, to the CRM firms, to the archaeologists, historical commissions, um, those, you know, just working with the federal agencies that don't necessarily understand um, sovereignty and uh, indigenous rights and different terminology, Um, you know, trying to fit within a federal model is is sometimes difficult for us because the language that's being used, um, it's not language necessarily that we connect with or that we define in in that same sense. Um, And so Mm -hmm. we're working to, you know, better merge um, under a federal model, but at the same time, implementing things that, you know, speak to who we are and and what we... um, you know, actually need. So just preservation, protecting as, as much as possible um, within our site, at least for our function. So do you have any long-term goals of what you would ultimately like to do or like to see happen within your program? Absolutely. Again, there are certain things that we work on with the neighboring tribes. Um, right now, we're doing 
we actually submitted a multiple property listing to the National Register just recently, um, and that's being awaited um, by the keeper for their signature. And so right now, again, we're, we're going through the legal process of working with the towns and historical commissions um, in surveying those properties. Um, Ultimately, the goal at the end of those would be to have a program established that we would be able to bring our tribal youth to. Um, If we have a ceremonial site um, and we have certain astronomical alignments um, that they may not necessarily understand at this point. Um, And so being able to educate our tribal youth um, directly at those places, um, tribal education, um, and we're very much involved with our tribal elders. Um, And so having those programs established once we're done with the kind of legal legal background work um, with the towns and federal agencies, um, there are a lot of opportunities to train our youth in specific fields. Um, Archaeology, indigenous archaeology, that would be one um, that we would love to have, um, you know, in the future. And so working with the tribal youth, we work with them in the summer um, in our department and just making sure that, you know, when we're gone, um, that they can just pick up the ball and and continue going with it. Um, So we're really doing a lot of the legwork. Um, you know, hopefully to be able to, to pass off, to create a, a strong foundation and process that, you know, anyone um, would be able to follow. One of our, I would say two more items, I would say, um, you know, immediate future, we have, as we discussed, you know, the few families that did reside on the reservation, some of the um, oldest homes, there's, there's two specifically, Um, on the reservation and it it definitely sheds light on what the original homes on the reservation look like Um, exterior interior as well as plant life Um, what was being grown we have plants that you know don't necessarily grow um, in many areas that are still appearing um, outside of these home foundations um, that we have you know around the reservation blood root and and everything else so recreating um, that's that's probably not the best word but to um, have those homes reestablished um, as a way um, of an educational piece again um, something mm-hmm. that they can go to um, they can look at the gardens they can see you know what was planted then for what purposes how they were used how we utilize um, them today and making sure those like relic plant communities are still in existence um, for time to come um, so that would definitely be one and on this separate aspect a lot of it would surround NAGPRA, um, repatriation. Um, we have a lot of scenarios where there have been incidents of, you know, grave looters. Um, we, we've had a, a lot of those experiences historically where you, our, our bodies have been robbed and mm-hmm. we can't find them. Um, and it's not a few, it's it's a lot of them. Um, and, and so that's that's always emotional work. Um, you're dealing with you know institutions, you're dealing with colleges and universities um, and, and trying to you know piece together everything just to be able to to bring them home um, in, in the most appropriate way. Um, and you know we're, we're really working um, on that side as far as you know organizing, um, pulling all of the material that we have. But you know one of the biggest goals is to um, to find them um, and, and to rebury them so that you know they can rest in peace because it's you know a basic human right. <clears throat> we have we have a um, a wampum belt um, that is um, being held by the. Uh, the Royal British Museum. That, and can uh, you explain really quick to those that might not know about them what a wampum belt is? Um, it was is mostly worn as uh, as ceremonial. Um, wampum is kind of um, one of those things where some people believe that it was a form of currency. Um, we we have um, conflicting histories on that, um, but mostly. But one thing that isn't 
of, of conflicting is we know that we wore wampum as as a form of a of ceremony, and so for a museum to be in possession of this, um, it would have been worn by someone of statue uh, from from our nation. We confirmed this because um, we had a contingency of our elders go over to England to visit, and um, they um, they allowed them to to see the belt. And um, but you know there have been, from what I understand, requests made to have it returned to us, and they uh, they thus far have refused. Mm-hmm. Um, and I th- and I think part of what bothers us, and um, you know, we've we've as Marissa pointed out, you know, in talking with other other tippos, when requests like that are made, um, one of the resounding uh, answers we we hear is, "Well, we're protecting it for you," and right. you know, we're like, "Well, no one can protect something better than you know, the place it came from originally." And, and so, you know, that, that, that response, uh, really kind of gets old and it's, it's, it also is rather hurtful. Um, this particular belt we, we feel was, um, taken from someone, um, that may have actually been from, I believe the, uh, the battle of 1637. Mm-hmm. Um, again, if it was somebody of, of, of statue. So, um, we'll continue to try to recover that but um but that that speaks to the core of um of um nagpra activity you know right um, it's, and it's much harder when it, when they're items that have um left uh the, you know left the united states yeah international repatriation is picking up right now i would mm-hmm. say um the past several years because it's a scenario that a lot of um mm-hmm. tribal nations are experiencing um, you know, at the onset of colonization, when trading, especially in this area, was at its height, um, again, a lot of our, um, you know, wampum belts, wampum material, whatever we were trading at the time is now, you know, within those museums. And, you know, federal policy obviously doesn't cover um, international. And so a lot of times we we have been looking at um, UNDRIP standards and, you know, how we can um, apply that. Um, but it's it's definitely you know slow moving, but hopefully it it picks up you know in the future. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we are I think over time. I bet. <laughs> um, yeah. it, it always happens. Um, so, is there anything that you want to finish out with? Anything that you want to add, or any advice for other tribes that maybe are going through something similar, archaeologists, whoever? I would say that as a tribe, um, we have had many challenges. We have tried to survive um, year after year, generation after generation, um, and although we have experienced certain economic boosts, we're still a community that that struggles um, from historical trauma, and a lot of those aspects are still very much present today. And so, although sometimes we do receive criticism, I guess I would say, from individuals or from the public for just us as a community to acknowledge what we have been through um, and how how we come out of it each time. You know, we're a very strong, resilient um, community full of heartfelt, beautiful um, individuals um, that, you know, love to help others. And just realizing that as a community that we've we've always been um you know a beautiful strong community um and and also realizing that a, a lot of this the core of this is you know individuals that may not necessarily understand particulars of um native communities or um indian law um that are very much applicable um going back to the audio clip the one thing that i picked up on was, you know, what's the difference between, you know, a a tribal nation and kind of other, you know, ethnic or minority groups. Um, And so understanding that, you know, it's it's about political status. It's not about um, racial racial classification. Mm -hmm. Um, So those different um, distinctions um, 
and you know we're we're going to have challenges and i think you know we're always hopefully we can move forward um out of our survival mode to to actually um you know enjoy everything that we've worked hard for and also when you are a tribal community that is surrounded by the public i would say that has um large interaction with the non-tribal community um non-tribal businesses non-tribal archaeologists um to to not feel threatened in in any type of way um to to value the education that you've received from your tribal elders from your grandparents um and, and to know that's real and um you know, you don't necessarily um, have to, you know, have a PhD. I think those are great, um, but also to to appreciate and recognize, um, you know, what you were taught culturally um, from your community, um, and and to stay strong um, with that, um, even though sometimes it, it can be challenging um, around those that may not um, be tribal, um, and they just have different perspective um and the what can come from collaboration um you know when you work with different groups of people with different backgrounds different understandings um collaboration i find especially within our role of work with a lot of um tribal people um non-tribal people um we come out a lot better at the end um, when we work together, when we participate, um, and when tribal involvement, um, you know, is included in the process. Mm -hmm. Michael, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Not much I could really add to that other than um, if I'm speaking to tribes, um, um, I'm a big fan of empowerment. And that means, you know, being able to um, use your, your voice, however that However, that may be, you know, my world, I've chosen to use um, audio and broadcast, but um, it might be through writing, it might be through blogs, it might be through education, educating others, um, native as well as non-native, you know, um, you know, whatever tools you have at your exposure and what you're comfortable with, um, that that is your empowerment and it's your right to, to, um, to express that. Um, you know, often I talk about um, the need um, of, of uh, tribal communities to um, to define their own narratives as opposed to, um, you know, letting it be defined for them. And, and sometimes that just simply comes out of, you know, others' lack of knowledge and understanding that, you know, that again, Native and non-Native alike. So as Marissa said, it's always better to collaborate. It's always better to work together to understand these these. Uh, these things collectively. Um, and, and the last thing I, I usually say is also framing, um, uh, framing a, 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 a thing is important. So for example, there's a difference between an issue and a problem. An issue can be debated and discussed. A problem is something that needs to be solved. And I think sometimes those two get um, combined. Um, so I think as a community, it's important that we sort of um, frame those conversations um, with that understanding. So, and also just thank you for the opportunity to, to speak with you and your audience. So, thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was really, really, really interesting. Thanks for listening to the Heritage Voices podcast. You can find show notes at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash heritage voices. Please subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or the Google Music Store. Also, if you like the show, please share with your friends or write us a review. If you have any questions, comments, or show suggestions, please reach out to me at jessica at livingheritageanthropology.org or you can find me on Facebook through Living Heritage Anthropology or on Twitter at Living Heritage A. As always, thank you to Lyle Belenqua and Jason Nez for their collaboration on our incredible logo. This show is produced by Chris Webster and Tristan Boyle and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network.
Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US dollars a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more info.